With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, let me call on our first speaker, our Vice Chancellor, Prof. Bongilamut. Good evening, colleagues. Um, this evening, uh, we have actually had a very good and um, active week, a, a real and intellectual feast. So uh, it is really my pleasure uh, to be here to welcome uh, all of you here. I've not had time to, to see who is in the room, so I'm going to say all protocol is observed. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, recognize our visitors uh, that are here uh, with us this evening. Uh, I, I have here uh, Professor Pope Davis uh, from Ohio State University, who is the Dean of the College of Education and Human Ecology. Uh, and then he is accompanied by uh, his other colleagues, including my former colleague from Forte, Professor Chris Igodan who is a professor of agriculture. Uh, we worked together at Forte those many, many years ago. So it's lovely uh, to have you, uh, Prof, and, and your colleagues, uh, all of you, Kerry, and all of you. Um, I would like to uh, start again by just uh, thanking uh, uh, Colela for being such a big part uh, of our work and of the epic journey that we are beginning to take uh, uh, in a scholarly manner to recognize the contribution of Mandela uh, to our country, our continent, and, and the world. I want to uh, greet all the young people that are here. I'm very proud of our students. Uh, uh, in the two days, I've spent a lot of time with our students uh, yesterday and today. I'm proud of the caliber of our students that uh, is coming through uh, uh, so uh, the engagement of our students, I believe, has not been in vain. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm quite convinced that we are going to turn out students that are going to take key leadership positions uh, in our democracy and in the world. Uh, today, as we host uh, Professor Mangu, Mangu's uh, uh, second lecture, uh, it is the last day of the Mandela month today. Uh, 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 the, the, the 31st of um, July, but also it is the last day when we are celebrating uh, the Mandela centenary, which we started on the 18th of July last year. So it is a very important day for us, as I'm going to indicate why. Um, but in a big way and in a special way, for me, this is not an end. Rather, after a year long of engaging the idea of Mandela and its meaning for us as an academic institution, it is the beginning of the work that needs to be done as we reinvent ourselves as a university in service of society. So even though it is the last day of the centenary today for us, it is the beginning of the long work that we need to do uh, as we went public last April to say that in line with the ethos of Madiba, we are going to place our scholarship in service to society. As I shared with the audience last week, at the first Mandela lecture, our Mandela centenary ran from July 2018 with scholarly and other activities across our seven faculties. The celebrations running from July 2018 to Prof. Mandu's uh, second lecture today have included a variety of events hosted by the seven faculties, illustrating the depth and breadth of this university's scholarly project. The official centenary program began with a two-day colloquium by the Faculty of Education, seeking to interrogate Mandela's famous statement that education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. That was in July last year. The law faculty a rights Conference celebrated the South African Constitution and Mandela's role 
in its creation, and arts faculty hosted a conference that explored being humane in the 21st century. The university also hosted a number of public lectures as part of the celebrations. The former public protector advocate Tulima Tonsela asked whether the constitution is responsible for the social justice gap in South Africa, while former Deputy Chief Justice uh, Tihang Museneke, who is also our esteemed doctora, honorary doctor, um, also tackled the issue of social justice in a lecture that was entitled Rethinking Private Law and Social Justice Post Mandela. South African Reserve Bank Governor, who is also a, a, my colleague, I went to SOAS uh, with him, uh, uh, Mr. Hanyako, spoke on the role of the central bank in building democracy. During the National Science Week last year, in 2018, July, which the Nelson Mandela University Science Faculty participated in with their drive uh, called the Road to Mveso program, uh, which was titled Deepening Our Democracy Through Science in Honor of Mandela. So these are just some of the uh, events that we have had this year uh, to celebrate uh, the 100th year of the birth of Madiba. Another notable initiative was the launch of the annual Nelson Mandela Convention for Youth Development, the first iteration of which was titled Living in the Age of Hope uh, of Madiba and focused, oh, Living in the Age and Hope of Madiba <laughs> and focused on issues relating to education, leadership, employability, entrepreneurship, uh, health and wellness. Uh, incidentally, the second annual youth uh, convention ended today and uh, it has been a huge success as far as I'm concerned. And I've said to the Dean that I hope that we are going to document uh, um, what happened in the past two days so that uh, it provides a learning archive uh, for our students uh, and, for, and for our scholars as well. In September 2018, we held the Dalipunga, this time that Mandela Film, Book and Documentary Festival, where we explored the multiplicity of the figure of Mandela through the myriad books, films, and documentaries about him. This was a precursor to the Talipunga this time, that Mandela Colloquium that we held in March this year. The closing out week of our Mandela Centenary Program, importantly, included a seminar last week uh, by Professor Rilebohile Muletzane on rethinking legacies in the midst of the war on women's bodies, a, a feminist ghost dance with Mandela as part of the last stretch of the centenary celebrations. This seminar explored one of the significant themes that emerged from the Talipunga Colloquium, Mandela, Feminisms, and Intersectionality. In her talk, Professor Muletzane asked what scholarship on Mandela might offer to feminism, if anything at all, considering both his statements, that is Matiba's statements, and his silences, in response to gender discrimination and violence. If we have not yet done so, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to our DVC uh, of um, People and Operations, uh, Mr. Lewokhang Hashatse, and his communication team and events management team for holding the centenary program together in such a meaningful way. It has been a huge success as far as I am concerned. From our centenary program, the key values of Madiba around education, social justice, human rights, and the humane <coughs> were re-energized. It is now our responsibility, colleagues, to mobilize the gains of the centenary program for our own human and academic projects. We have, over the past year, sought to bring a scholarly orientation to, the, to our engagement with the, with the idea of Mandela as ways of rooting ourselves deeper into the challenges of poverty and inequality that his name uh, bring to the fore for us. But 
What does this mean in practice? Let me share four, four quick points on that uh, before I conclude. First, it means a deeper and more historically nuanced treatment of Mandela away from the dominant tropes of the romanticized hero. Secondly, we cannot uncritically accept ready-made narratives of Mandela, especially when properly historicized understandings of Mandela provide, as the centenary program revealed to us, far more useful tools for thinking through our responsibilities as a university that is striving for social justice. Thirdly, it seems our standard way of making sense of the present challenges we are facing as a society and what to do about them has reached its limits. There is a sense that consistent revis revisitations of the idea of Mandela may provide us with new understandings and options for action. Finally, Mandela gives a human face to our social justice aspirations as a university and as a country and as a continent. This sketch requires constant reworking and redrawing to respond to the shifting and deepening challenges of our time. This reworking is our task. And for that, we require a scholarly but yet practical angle. Prof Mandu's scholarship gives us a real chance of how this can be done. In his last week's lecture, which I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, termed The Untold Heritage, he challenged the tribalization of Mandela's history. In so doing, he challenged the insidious intellectual racism underlying such approaches to Mandela's biography. The assumption that African people belong to a world that is not developed. He challenged that. In nuancing the account of Mandela's history through exploration of his experience with political modernity and his identification as a black Victorian, Prof Manu provided insight into the Mandela that avoided the various cut and paste images of Mandela, namely the romanticized revolutionary hero, as I've referred to, the cuddly dancing grand grandfather, a sellout to white interests. Instead, in sketching the image of Mandela, inclusive of contradictions and complex relations to power, Prof Mandu both offered and called for greater historical understanding of and empathy for our people of which Matiba is just one. It is here, argue, arguably, uh, that we can begin to find new ways to approach the challenges of our time by understanding our own contradictions and complexities and extending both critique and empathy to our view of our own moment in history. This evening's lecture, therefore, uh, uh, titled Mandela's tragic pragmatism, leadership as radical sacrifice, will pick up where last week's lecture left off. Here, we will explore, we have been promised, Mandela as a tragic hero, whose pragmatic cooperation and Victorian elitism, elitism did not protect him from white racism. As Professor Mangu notes in his abstract, this tragic perspective not only heightens our empathy for human suffering, but also it inspires us to action. It is action based on the knowledge that, to borrow a line from Prof Mangu's lecture last week, and I quote, Africans have to find a way out of no way, close quote. Tonight, we have an opportunity to learn more about how Mandela found his way and to reflect on the way forward we ourselves must chart. I thank you, therefore, for joining us this evening in listening uh, to Professor Mandu's exposition. Thank you very much.
thank you very much mama for that great contribution and analysis ladies and gentlemen prof Clara Mangu is a professor of sociology at george washington university in washington dc he was previously professor of sociology at the university of cape town prof Mangu obtained his phd in city and regional planning from cornell university and phd and masters from Wits university he has published nine books including Biko, a biography which won UCT Meritorious Book Award in 2013. He is currently a new is currently writing a new biography of Nelson Mandela, and Sunday Times has described Prof. Mangu as possibly South Africa's most prophetic public intellectual. Ladies and gentlemen, let us allow and welcome <laughs> Prof. Mangu. I don't know about the last part. <laughs> I know there's some friends of mine who might contest that. Uh, thank you, VC. Uh, thank you, Andre, and your team. Um, what I propose to do today is a result of an idea I had in 2013. And this idea was the idea of Mandela as a tragic hero which is a counterintuitive idea given the romance of Mandela as a romantic, triumphant figure. Last week I spoke about the need to locate Mandela within the long history of African political modernity. Today I aim to do something even more ambitious. I propose to take a different tack and place Mandela in the long history of ideas and in challenging the cheering story of romance. I'm going to go back 2,000 years and hopefully you'll bear with me as I do that. The cheering story of romance that we have come to know, to accept about Mandela, is a, diff, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a similar way of thinking as the traditionalist romance I spoke about last time, except the subject is different. It is the idea that February the 2nd, 1990, constitutes a break in history. It's like the rivers of history stopped flowing on that day, and new rivers emerged with no source in particular. This narrative of February 1919, 1990, as the sharing story of romance, I'm going to argue, disguises more than it explains. It produces its own mechanisms of amnesia, with Mandela obviously as the archangel of liberty. Needless to say, this is an ahistorical way of thinking about society. But it also plays a political function. It's a political function that seeks to absolve the white community in particular of the long, of their complicity in the long history of colonial and apartheid rule. If we can talk about our history as triumph, 
and we focus on 1990s triumph. We are perforce asked to turn away from talking about experience. The moment of triumph is the moment of outcomes. But the experience of oppression that black people particularly went through is blocked from view. And so because the past is seen as having passed, no one bears any responsibility for what happened, including Mandela's own incarceration. But surely we know better than that, that Mandela and his comrades would never have been in prison for so many years if the white community did not want him to be in prison. They would simply have told their government to release him, failing which they would have voted them out of power. It's as simple as all that. But that is not what happened. The same government was voted back into office for decades on end. And so when we focus only on the moment of outcome, on that cheerful moment, all of this complicity is somehow swept under the rug. But not only that, the experiences of black people are also swept under the rug. <laughs> and so it seems to me that we have to find a different way of thinking about Mandela that is outside of that romantic view. Because it is a romantic view that is not only historical, but counterproductive. It deprives us of the, of, of the memory upon which any nation is built. <coughs> the dialectic of forgetting and remembering is the essence of nation building. That's at least what Enes Renan argued and what Benedict Anderson argued also in his wonderful book, Imagined Communities. For sure, we cannot always remember, for sure nations somehow have to forget certain experiences. What's true for nations is true for individuals. You can't be thinking all the time, hey, what <laughs> right? You, right? You forget because that's what it means to be a productive human being. And that's the same with nations. But that quality of forgetting should not translate in, into an existential condition of forgetfulness. Another reason why we should um, reject the sharing story of romance if Mandela was so successful, if Mandela was so triumphant, how do you explain the existential misery that is the life of black people in this country? And so the, the sharing story of romance is dangerous to Mandela himself because it sets him up for the kind of criticism and attacks on him. And so instead of interrogating the story of romance, young people blame Mandela. Instead of appreciating the historical nature of what we're talking about here, And this is why 
I go back 2,000 years to the idea of the tragic hero as a way of trying to think about how do we get around this dilemma? How do we get around, in fact, this intellectual poverty, quite frankly? And so over the past five years, I've been reading and talking and trying to make sense of all of this. One of the strangest things about our country and the way we talk about our history, which is another part of the sharing story of romance, is how even Robin Island, the experience of Robin Island, is completely beyond public knowledge. Very few people know actually about the experience of Robin Island which was a tragic experience. Instead, Robben Island is presented as a university of ideas. I don't want to go to that university for sure, and I wouldn't want my children to go to that university. So this is part of the these tropes of triumph and, and denial, quite frankly. But as Simon Krishni writes, we may think we are done with the past, but the past is never done with us. Or as Terry Eagleton similarly argues, the past is like a banished ghost lacking at the edges of our existence. <laughs> The idea of the tragic hero is an idea that we owe to the Greeks. It was a literary vehicle that the Greeks used for exploring <laughs> and often questioning the political, social, and civic values of Athens. Now you may ask, what does Greece have to do with Mandela? That was 2,000 years ago. In this, you would not be alone, and that's understandable, but that is because we assume, sitting here in the 21st century, that Greece had nothing to do with us. When in fact, Greece was shaped by Egypt and Africa. My good friend Martin Bernal wrote an authoritative book called Black Athena, and I urge you to read it. And it turns on its head the whole, the entire, what we've always known about Western civilization and how actually it was influenced by Egypt. Even the idea of the tragic hero and tragedy was influenced by Egypt. The idea of, the, of tragedy suggests a different way of thinking about society, about individual life. No life is an exercise in triumph. Tell me a single person here in the room who's never had setbacks, for whom everything is like just a sharing story of happiness and romance. What tragedy does is to give us a way of thinking about the contradictions, that they, they, there is no such thing as triumph over the human condition. In 1973, Arthur Fugard produced an, an, an adaptation 
of one of the most widely adapted of the Greek tragedies. And this is Sophocles' Antigone. And by the way, if you want to be feminists, which we must be, all of us, you must read that book, Antigone, written more than 2,000 years ago. It is a story of a young woman, Antigone, who defies her uncle, Creon, who has issued a decree that Antigone's brother, Polynices, will not get a proper burial, the like any other body. Polynices will not get a proper burial, Creon says, because he had betrayed the town of Thebes when he joined with foreign forces in an attack on the city and killed his own brother, Etiochus. Their uncle, Creon, who takes over as the ruler of uh, uh, Thebes, instructs that Etiochus get, gets this proper burial, but Polynices will be left rotting in the sun. Antigone refuses to go along with this, and this is the essence of that play. Even if his bro her brother, Polynices, was in the wrong, she argues, like all sisters tend to do, that it is against the wishes of the gods that his body be left to rot in the sun. So she goes ahead against the decree and buries her brother. And then this is what she says to Creon, among other things. That I shall die, I knew well enough, even without your proclamation. How could I not? And if I die before my time, I call it again. For how would one who lives like me, beset by evils, not gain by dying? And so, I say that meeting with this death will bring no pain at all to me. But if I let my brother, born of my mother, lie dead and, and, and unburied, that would cause me pain, but this does not. And if you think I've acted foolishly, maybe I'm being charged with folly by a fool. When Arthur Fugard adapted this play, this play took, took place more than 2,000 years ago, when Arthur Fugard adapted this play in 1973, it was a play to tell the story of Robben Island. The play was actually called The Island, if you're old enough to remember. I want to read, here's what's important about this for Port Elizabeth. That the two actors in this play are Winston Jonah and John Gunn. The play opens with John Gunn, who is acting in, in the role of Creon, inviting Winston to participate. And this is what Jonah says. Go to hell, man. Only last night, you were telling me that this Antigone thing is a bloody, what do you call it, legend, a myth, a Greek one at that. Bloody thing never happened, not even history. Look, brother, I've got no time for bullshit. 
Fuck legends. Me, I live here. I live my life here. I know why I'm here. It's history, not legends. I had my chat with the magistrate the other day, and now I'm here. Your Antigone is a child's play, man. In Chona's dismissive attitude towards this play, it's of course um, a literary device that Arthur Fugard is using, should be seen against what happens in December 1975, when Nelson Mandela and his colleagues on Robben Island decide to stage their own version of Antigone. And in this version on Robben Island, Mandela decides to play the role of Creole. You would have expected, right, that he would play the role of Antigone, the heroic figure. He does this because, well, partly because he's got a sense of irony and a sense of humor. But he does this because of the ambiguity that is central to this play. That while it is easy to see Antigone as a heroic figure, what is actually happening is a clash in world visions. Now, I don't want to read too much into that, that Mandela is preparing himself for a situation where he is going to have to mediate and understand the other side, understand what it means to be a ruler. But this is what he says in a letter to Fatima Mier. He writes, you say that myths are not to be taken at their face value, and that underlying are the great moral lessons. I accept that completely. And whatever shifts may have occurred in my own outlook, I realize more than ever before the dynamic role of mythology in the exposition of human problems and in the molding of human character. A few years ago, I was browsing, I love the slide, so let me read it slowly. A few years ago, I was browsing hurriedly through a review of the works of Euripides, of Sophocles, and the other Greek scholars. when I came across the statement that one of the basic tenets we have inherited from classical Greek philosophy was that a real man, well, Matiba, and a real woman in the case of Antigone, was one who could stand firmly on their feet and never bend their knees even when dealing with the divine. How does it happen that somebody who, in his own words, is inspired by tragedy and yet gets to be interpreted through the sheer story of romance? How does that happen? What Mandela is doing, and his colleagues, of course, is to explore and, and, and role play what it actually means to be in the position that they are in. That perhaps they might have to put themselves in the feet, in the shoes of the others.
But more importantly, David Scott argues, if, if one of the great lessons of romance, of the cheering story of romance, is that we are masters and mistresses of our destiny, that our past can be left behind and new futures lived into, tragedy has a less sanguine teaching to offer. Tragedy has a more respectful attitude to the past, to the often cruel permanence of its impress. Close quote. This approach to the past, it seems to me, can help many of those who call Mandela a sellout to have a better sense of this cruel permanence of the past, which no single individual can ever overcome. I mentioned in my last lecture that in 2005, I invited Wally Soyinka, Henry Louis Gates Jr., and Cornell West to come and give a series of lectures on the meaning of Mandela. In his lecture, Cornell West spoke about how important it is that we do not look at Mandela through this romantic lens. He says, I don't want folks to be satisfied when they talk about Mandela. He constitutes such a challenge, a moral challenge, a political challenge, and an intellectual challenge. Cornel West writes that, or said at that in, during his election, that what we need to do with respect to somebody like Mandela is to place him within this long durée of ideas that stretch millennia. I know when we talk about Mandela, we just often think about uh, the guy that sold out, right? Mati, butata, lowest exile, all right? What Cornell West and many other people that I've been talking about is, is how important it is that we place Mandela within this long history of ideas. From Jesus, and, and here I mean the historical Jesus, to Socrates, that we should have this imagination of placing our people within this long arc of ideas, but we tend to be provincial when we talk about Mandela. We never think about him as somebody who existed beyond our own space. And this book is an attempt not only to reinterpret Mandela, but to insert him in world intellectual history. Other people do this all the time. I don't know how many books have been written about George Washington. Or Abraham Lincoln. Well, I know about Lincoln, it's about 62,000. Other people and other societies theorize about their leaders and what they mean in the greater scheme of world ideas. We've never done that about any of our leaders. Actually, we've done it up, uh, with Rico, but certainly not with Mandela. And as Terry Eagleton argues, people do not take inspiration from Jesus because he died. They take inspiration from Jesus because of the idea of the resurrection. And that's the same thing with tragedy. That tragedy is what impels people to action to take seriously the human condition.
If all you do is have the sheer story of romance, nothing will impel you to do anything. Another important dimension which Cornell was uh, addressed during that day was that we need, we need, therefore, when we think about Mandela, we think about him within the context of what it means to be human. The word or the term human, Cornell West argues, has its, its, its origins in the Latin word humando. And this word humando means learning how to die. <clears throat> that part of the inescapable, inescapable part of the human condition is grappling with death. When Mandela says to the judge at the Ravonia trial, if needs be, I am prepared to die, he is doing what Cornell West is talking about. He is doing what Antigone was telling Creon. When Steve Nico prophesizes in his book, I write what I like. Go and read it. There's a chapter, it's a very small chapter. It's called On Death. When Nico says, my death, which will come when it comes, will be a politicizing thing, close quote. He's learning how to die. And of course, Robert Sobukwe, in that cottage where they kept him, was living a social death. And, and, and what needs to happen, folks, is that we need to take seriously the experiences of our people. We need, we need to get into the meaning of this whole thing that we've been talking about. What does it actually mean? And what does it actually mean in the larger scheme of events? What does it actually mean for humanity? If we do that kind of interrogation, not only will we come with a, a different way uh, of, of, of looking at Mandela, we might ourselves imagine ourselves acting in that way, because that is what the tragic sensibility does. Finally, in tragedy, even Antigone, there is no such thing as an individual hero. The nature of tragedy is that when the hero dies, or the heroine in the case of Antigone, the action continues. The tragic action continues. Because the tragic action precedes and succeeds the hero. When Mandela was born, African people were long being oppressed. And they would long be oppressed long after he was gone. Because in tragedy, this is the way, the way that the Greeks were saying we should think about society. There is no individual hero as such in Greek tragedy. Why does this matter for us? It matters because we need to get away from the idea of Mandela as the individual hero of our struggle. That we locate him and contextualize him within the larger tragic action. And when we do that, we'll stop calling him a sellout. Because we will realize that actually, that is the nature of tragedy. The action, the tragic action, is much more powerful than any individual. And so, 
But then again, this focus on the individual is a very Western thing. Okay? And as Raymond Williams, one of the greatest literary writers ever, argues, when we confine ourselves to the hero, to the action of the hero, we are unconsciously confining ourselves to one kind of experience, which in our own culture, and the talk about Western culture, we tend to take as a whole. We need to stop the pretense that Mandela, or the ANC for that matter, capture the entirety of the black experience. It never was, it never will be. Long before the ANC was formed, black people were part of the tragic action. And long after it is gone, the tragic action will continue. So we need to find a way, it seems to me, an analytic way to think about our experience and what it means. How much time do I have here, Andrew? <laughs> oh, good enough. That's good. So, folks, that's just my theoretical thinking. Okay? That's, this is how I'm, I'm, I'm saying we need to find a way of thinking about our leaders in a serious intellectual way. You don't have to accept the idea of the tragic hero, but please find another one. We cannot be stuck in this monologue of he was a sellout. And what sellout, by the way, chooses to spend 27 years in prison? I mean, that's a rather strange way of being a sellout. Mandela was offered this now a little segue to the idea of pragmatism in my talk. And I argue that the history, the black of black people in this country, despite our pretense of, at being revolutionaries, has always been this history of pragmatism. The power of colonial violence was such that black people had to find ways of surviving, find ways out of that, out of nowhere. <clears throat> This assault on, on black people as part of the larger, larger tragic action, Mandela finds himself right in the middle of it when he goes to Johannesburg in the 1940s. For the first time, he experiences racism. He had never, as I said in my, in, my, in my talk last time, the trans guy was never occupied by whites. It didn't have the kind of everyday racism that the rest of the country had. And Mandela, for the first time in his life, experiences white racism. Guess where? At our, at our university, at Vets University where he wants to study law. And they deny him, and they deny him, and they finally exclude him. But what is happening to him at that time at Vitz University is what is happening to the African elite in general. That's why, again, it's very important to place him within the larger tragic action. Despite these experiences, of racism, even when he is elected into the leadership of the ANC, he is 
the most pragmatic of the lot. He's militant, but he's the most pragmatic of the lot. And I argue that this has to do with his uh, background. When the Queen of England came to South Africa in 1947, there was a meeting at Mandela's house in Soweto. And the ANC Youth League decided to boycott and protest the Queen's visit. Madiba Ngozi was the only one to object. You can't do that to a queen. Right? That is part of his upbringing, right? You do not disrespect royalty. Okay? Even when Mandela goes underground, he is the one who's always opening, leaving open the door that, guys, we must negotiate. This is in the 1950s. In fact, the best essay, in my view, Mandela ever wrote, and I say that without any fear of contradiction, is an essay called The Struggle Must Have Many Tactics, written in 1957. And in this, against the militants in the movement, he says, let the democratic movement, the ANC, have a voice both outside and inside parliament. Through the advisory boards, and if the right type of candidates are found through parliament, we can reach the masses of the people and rally them behind us. Right? This is an idea of collaboration, of cooperation. And he gets this long letter from I.B. Tabata telling him that he's selling out. This is part of the long debate between collaboration and non-collaboration. Even when Mandela decides to form Umkondo with Sizwe, he's still leaving open the idea of collaboration and negotiation. In other words, we tend to think of negotiations as something that started, Mandela started in 1988. If you look at the actual record, as early as 1973, he was meeting with Jimmy Kruger. who was then the Minister of Prisons. And then he met with uh, Coutier, who was, a, was a, the, the general. But then again, what happened is that there were these conspiracy theories. That is selling out. I mean, one of the most absurd of those conspiracy theories was that the government had actually taken Mandela out of uh, Robben Island to Zambia and to brief him, and then put him back on Robben Island. This is, of course, absurd. As Meg Maharaj writes, or told his comrades in exile, he says, comrades, I have stayed in that section from 5th January 1965 to October 1976. I live in it cheek by jowl with Mandela. Nobody could move away from those sections without my being aware. It's impossible. So I'm surprised to hear this rumor that Madiba was in Zambia. There is no way he could have disappeared. Maharaj writes, and come to Lusaka and met with John Foster in the state house in Lusaka, even for a day without our noticing it. The point of my argument is this, is that on Robben Island, actually, Mandela took upon himself 
Somebody, uh, somebody was telling me this the other day. But he took upon himself the role of the mother. He was the one on Robben Island, and excuse my language, who cleaned up after other people's shit. When Eddie Daniels, you know, they were using the bucket system. When Eddie Daniels couldn't help himself, right, couldn't clean his own bucket, it was Mandela who would clean Eddie Daniels' bucket. Okay? It was Mandela who was acting as a lawyer on behalf of the other prisoners. And he would get solitary confinement for that. There was something in Robben Island called Drimaldeye. You know Drimaldeye? You know Drimaldeye? It's when you are deprived of all your meals. But Mandela continued with this notion that I'm going to continue talking with them. Because it is by talking with them that in the middle of winter, when I need a blanket, I have to talk to them. And he encourages other comrades. And then there was a revolt against Mandela. Why are, you, why are you always you know, talking to these people? Why are you always cooperating? And he says, comrades, it is by cooperating with these people, by the way, that we get to communicate. We get all these um, uh, opportunities, all these privileges that we can communicate with Lusaka. And that's how he communicated with Lusaka, with Oliver Tambo. I am saying that as a leader, it was inescapable and unavoidable that he should do this. And when it takes that step to actually uh, start negotiations on his own, he didn't tell the others. Govan Beggy was mad. Govan Beggy was mad. Sisulu was mad. Raymond Klaba says, Muli didn't do the what were you waiting for all this time? Couldn't <laughs> even <laughs> Right? What I'm trying to say, folks, is that, and we must do what other societies actually do about their leaders. You know, write a book about the dynamics between these founding fathers between the di and mothers. The dynamic between Mandela, Sisulu, Mbeki, Nshaba, Katrada, Adelaide Tambo, who once called Mandela a conceited fool. Because they're friends, but because you don't mess with Adelaide Tambo, right? To understand that, you know, these folks were always in a continuous process of trying to figure out how to get out of the situation, how to make the best out of the situation. And so, what I'm trying to suggest, at the end of this, by the way, the general who is the head of Robben Island, one day, the prisoners, and I'm gonna stop at this, one day the prisoners go on strike, and they just stop. And Velemse goes to Mandela, says, Mandela, talk to you people. They need to work, you know? And um, Mandela goes to his people. He says, guys, come on, man. You know, you gotta work. That's prison, we gotta work, all right? Ah, no, go away, man. You know, we're not gonna, and stop being a messenger for the white man. But I argue in the book that when Valemse makes that overture. He's actually giving authority of Robben Island and of the prisoners over to Mandela in a symbolic way, but in a real way. Because what the prisoners do is they finally come around to accept what Mandela is saying. That, you know what, let's work. But as we work, we communicate amongst ourselves about what we need to do. So if you're a leader, I'm saying to you today, and this, this, this is what I mean, right, by this idea of, of, of sacrifice. 
that to be pragmatic is actually quite tragic. Because to be pragmatic actually means that you have to compromise on some of the most cherished ideals. Do you think Mandela was happy compromising all he did? And so um, when I talk about Mandela's tragic pragmatism, I'm trying to highlight a central co inescapable contradiction um, of leadership. And of course, nobody articulated, and I'll stop on this, this sense of pragmatism than Mandela himself when he wrote in Long Walk to Freedom, mm -hmm. in politics, no matter how much one plans, circumstances often dictate events. Thank you. Now I'm on the firing line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Time is always a social construct yeah. and a barrier in these things. <laughs> oh, apologies, apologies, Prof. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Prof, for that feast of wisdom that doesn't only forces us to read more, because I feel like I haven't read anything right now, <laughs> but it also forces us to interrogate things from more than just the surface. As you have said, Prof, now is the time for the firing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will now open up a round for Q and A. Can you please cut the keynotes and preambles yeah. to just the question? <laughs> time is all on our side. I will take hands now. One. We've got one hand. Okay. Uh, you mentioned last week that you went to the villages in India where they couldn't even speak English, and that you mentioned Nelson Mandela, and they managed to understand that. I'd like to know why did you actually mention him instead of Gandhi? I don't know myself. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Prof. I am one, I'm one that's known for preamble. Uh, I'll kick off by saying that now uh, I'm and I come from Kingdom Star. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Exact. Uh, it's my need for the to as a Question, uh, Prof, is that you know, ever since last week, I've been thinking of this question the whole time. Um, that you spoke about the untold heritage of Mandela, mm. and I asked myself, is is Prof the first person to realize this that Kanduma Tiba is 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 known this way, was written of him this way? Didn't Matiba, of course, see that there's also a couple of him is also can change or be put in a different way. Then I realized, could it be that the, 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 they were trying to protect the legacy of Mandela? Because if we say that he learned his leadership from missionary schools, then we'll be saying that we must give Mandela to the whites. That the reason why there was Mandela is because of the whites. You see, so by saying that he comes from a tribe and he learned from the tribal chief, then Simnika identity of Bausuka from Lenokuti. It this comes from being black. Mm -hmm. He learned it via the tribe. But if we say he comes from the, the missionary schools, then we'll be giving him away. Now, this is me just putting my, my, my question. Is, is, isn't the reason why the untold heritage of Mandela is this way? Is because they are trying to, to, to put him towards the African way. Instead of saying that he learned all these things from missionary schools. Thanks, Prof. Okay. Well, you know, there's... You, you, you've highlighted a, a tension between scholarship and politics. In, in politics, yeah, right. That's what you, that's what you do. In fact, um, the, the 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 reason why Mandela himself, in the original Long Walk to Freedom, did not speak about this history, was because you cannot have the leader of the movement, Kutwa, uh, 
otata ke babe skipunga right so so right it was a political thing that we can't reveal any everything right because you you compromise the the leader right but when you're a scholar it's a completely different matter you can't say i'm not going to do it because it's going to have these political implications mm -hmm. You can't, you, can't say, you can't say, I'm not going to reveal certain things, especially with biography. Well, with scholarship generally, you can't say, I'm not going to reveal it because of that. You just have to say, be truthful to history. Thank you. We still up for hands. Okay. Let me take advantage of the podium a bit, Prof. Um, I'd like to ask a, a question that has perhaps been a question before um, in terms of diversity as a value, right? And how does that not sort of perpetuate the over-romanticized Mandela and also giving a sort of an, a blanket approach to equality and also perhaps undermining the differences under diversity. So what does that mean when we speak of diversity as a value, but also trying to separate Mandela from being over romanticized and also taking into and acknowledging the differences and the different struggles that people have, but to also call ourselves diverse. I hope well, I'm making yeah. sense. I mean, diverse is, you know, diversity is, 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 I'm not a great fan of that concept. Um, mm. <laughs> I, I, you know, um, God, it can mean so many things. Um, mm. You know, um, a, um, justice, you know, um, justice, right? racial justice, uh, gender justice, uh, gay and lesbian justice, you know, that's for me a much more interrogative way of, of, of um, because diversity could mean like just putting people on a, on a, on a board, or, you know, and then claiming that you are diverse without actually engaging with and, and challenging the power relation. Mm. Mm. So it's about questions of justice, it's about questions of power. Mm. Um, so within that context, that, that, that's what I would do. I'll Thank go. you. Thank you. We've got a hand over there. Uh, Prof, I want to understand um, how do you think the attempts by the ANC and the National Party to forge a government of national unity have affected or rather categorized or shaped the character of Mandela to be what? Uh, today it's called uh, was a protect protectorate of uh, white interest or white people. You know the, the idea of uh, I've been thinking about this lately about the idea of that the whole notion about the government of national unity actually. And I haven't, I haven't researched this, so I'm just like speculating. So don't take notes. <laughs> Perhaps has some relation to the whole Bunga experience. Mm. You know, to, to Mandela is not a product of the government of national unity. He's already 70, 70 years and older. So he's bringing to this. I think, I think what's, in, what's important for folks to remember is that we are all, all of us, products of our times. Mm. All of us. We are products of our times. We are products of particular environments and cultures. <laughs> I was very critical of Mandela. I mean, I had a newspaper column, so all you need to do is just go back to my newspaper, right? Columns. And somehow, right? I did not have a sufficient appreciation of the fact that we had no chance in hell. We had no chance in hell in defeating that government. Right? So, so many people often think, hey, there was a revolution. 
and then and, and, and this revolution was marching forward, and Mandela kind of like compromised and sold out. No. We were as far from defeating the apartheid government in 1994 as we were in 1960. There was just no chance. There was no chance. We were overseas where, forget it. <laughs> okay. So, so all these compromises, for me, for me, what Mandela did is literally was to, to snatch victory in the jaws of defeat. Is that how you say it? But what he did basically, he realized that, you know what, militarily we'll never, we'll never, we'll never uh, uh, defeat these guys. But politically, we might have a chance that over time, right? Um, and we must also remember, I don't know how to illustrate this without seeming to be playing the struggle card or something. We were daily abused by white folks in this country. I don't know how much people understand that. Now we couldn't wear, I mean, you couldn't walk on the pavement. You couldn't walk on the pavement. You understand? And if you walk on the pavement, this guy's gonna hit you, and then you are the one who's gonna be arrested. This was the nature of our oppression. I don't know whether that is sufficiently, or if it can ever be sufficiently understood. They would knock at my mother's house, pick me up, take me, and pick me up the head with impunity. This was, the, this was the story, and Mandela's greatest insight, in my view, was to free us from that experience. Hmm. But like any tragic hero, there's no way to transform all of our lives. Hmm. Not even a god can do that. Hmm. Because the tragic action continues. You have to produce the next tragic hero. <laughs> <laughs> We've got two hands, Mr. Mtimka. Thank you. Uh, Prof, I think uh, what you've done is you've redeemed Mandela's legacy. Mm. At a time when, because uh, we, we feel a tension as the next generation to take the struggle forward, we want necessarily as a point of departure to frame our next uh, project from his weakness. But your, you, how you've done it, I've, I've heard you in, in the latter part of your response to the first question, responding to the question, coming, up, coming with the, the, the theory which we've now accepted, that between the theories of sellout, as an alternative to the theory of sellout, is the theory of a state, in fact, not a stalemate, but a stalemate to no chance. So that is the known narrative. What you've done for me, you've provided an, an alternative uh, a, a tool of analysis beyond that narrow uh, a, a stalemate versus uh, a set out thesis. This one of a, the, 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 the tragedy, you are bringing in a recognition that in fact, we are human, and all we do is we make a humble contribution to history and exit. And it shouldn't be framed as a correction of anybody's weakness. We are able to actually contribute, even in a revolutionary sense. And if it is perceived to be more revolutionary than the ones we were criticizing, it's just, it's just a, 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 in the broader scheme of things, it's still tragic. Mm. I think for me, that's a really kudos to you there. And you're helping us also who, who, who have a name uh, of Mandela so that as we, we heal that, that, that internal contradiction in terms of how we feel about him, mm. uh, because in, 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 you, you, you're absolving him at the same time, you are, you are in fact humbling him from an angel, but also humbly uh, absolving him. 
Thank you for that. Sorry, Prof. Sorry. Excuse me. I'm thinking that we should just take the two questions and you can just clap them together and respond. Thank you. Do we have a question over there? Good evening, colleagues. No, 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 sorry. The one with the blue hat. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I, I was hearing properly, but um, your whole discussion was around pragmatism in a way, whereby there will be what is popular, then let's revolt and all of that. The response from Mandela would be less practical. And, and, and uh, from an abstract view, of course, I, to a certain degree, I would say I, would, I, I do appreciate the realities that were there, and, and to a certain degree, the necessity of being practical. But for me, I, I, debating and, 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 and negotiating and all of that has always I've always find it to, to, to lead to no to no to no concrete conclusion of problems and solutions, providing practical solutions. And 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 you argue by now responding to, to Abu here that uh, militarily they could not have been uh, victorious. Okay, fine. Then they came to power. Uh, still they they were negotiating about the issues. I, I, I maybe the the, the, the army was still more on the side of the NP, I don't know, but if you wanted to provide uh, real solutions, you, you, I, I, my view is a more practical way would have been more autocratic because debating about problems, people starving and all of that, you are debating or negotiating. For me, I... <laughs> Please switch off your mic, Please you know, switch off you know, your mic. You know. Please switch off your mic. Thank you. We have the, lo the last hand. Thank you. It's me. Yes. <laughs> uh, good evening, colleagues. My name is Lita Mayosi. I'm a student here at NMU. Prof, it's become quite clear to me that uh, in your pending book, there are two themes. Uh, and that is not to mention that one is mutually exclusive to the other. The themes, in my opinion, is that of idealism and pragmatism. And uh, a question that I'd like to ask you is, having a knowledge of both of these outlooks on how to resolve conflict, mm. what quality, distinguishing quality, do you feel that um, Madiba used to discern which of the strategies was best at that particular time? Mm -hmm. You can think about uh, Shopville and how that incentivized the ANC to take up armed struggle, but then again, on a more pragmatic, since you can look at the decision to finally negotiate. And I think the comrade who just spoke before me raised a very important point about the inherent um, dangers perhaps in pragmatism and that it can lead to a certain level of paralysis. Because the thinking now amongst young people, be it about land or any other contentious issue that we feel our politicians should be resolving, is that they're negotiating too much. They're not pushing ahead with things that clearly there is consensus from. So yeah, uh, thank you. Great question. Um, Please switch off your mic. Yes. First, um, I just want to stipulate um, that you don't have to agree with Mandela to appreciate his sacrifice. Mm. I don't agree with Mandela. I have written this in my books and in my biography on so many things. I don't agree with him. And he knew I didn't agree with him. And he would invite me to his house and wag his finger at me. Okay? Uh, right? But, I, but right? he came to appreciate. I can't say he came to appreciate, <laughs> but he appreciated, right, mm. that some of us just didn't agree with the whole lot of things. So I'm not saying, I am not saying I want you to agree with Mandela. No. But I do want you to appreciate his sacrifice. I do want you to stop calling him a sellout. That's all I'm asking for. You know, when we walk out of here, we walk out of here now free, 
free, no fear of being arrested by the cops and being, of course there are problems. But all I'm asking for is that we should have this sense of history and appreciation of the sacrifices of those who came before us. You know, one of the weirdest things uh, the student movements uh, do, they like this phrase from Franz Fanon, that each generation <laughs> right, <laughs> must discover its own mission. <laughs> <laughs> the next line Fanon says, we must respect the contributions of our fathers and mothers. And we cannot say that they were not, because they compromised, therefore they were not heroes. But the comrades don't read the last part of the paragraph. <laughs> so, but on this, on this question of, uh, you know, uh, compromise leading to nowhere, um, Oh, the fact that we live in a, in a free society, for me, it's a very, very practical outcome of what happened. Mm -hmm. I am not happy with it. I am not happy with it. I, I, I'm, I'm very critical about it, but at least, at least we are not living under that kind of tyranny. Mm -hmm. A violent tyranny, by the way. Um, I, mean, I don't know what you mean when you say, you know, the alternative is just to just be autocratic. I mean, you know, uh, and, <laughs> you know, and who's going who's gonna to enforce that autocracy? I mean, you know, uh, so I'm not going to answer that one. What, what, what? I got it. So, you know, for me, what kind of leader? <laughs> What kind of leader? For me, leadership, right, is not, for me, leadership is seeing in the horizon. It's seeing, you know, when nobody is actually, when nobody is actually paying attention to have this kind of far-fetched sense of possibility. Where Mandela gets that, um, is a function, I think, of his upbringing, of his education. But remember, he's part of a collective of remarkable men and women, right? So there are contradictions all the way. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about um, being in the, you know, active in the student movement was that sense. And all of you will, 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 will say this when you are like my age that sense of I was around certain people and we influenced and we shaped each other. Uh, the fact that Mandela can think about Greek tragedy mm -hmm. and how it shapes, it shows you the broadness of the imagination. But that's what Steve Miko was doing too. Mm -hmm. And that's what Sokoko was doing too. They were thinking in a universal way, far beyond just South Africa. They were truly, in that sense, men of the world. And, and, and you can't be a leader if you don't have a sense of that. You know, the reason, when Steve Miko died, and I'll close on this, Steve Miko, you must get my book on Nico. I explain this, but I'll, 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 I'll summarize. Nico is sitting in his home at Kingsbury. And there are these guys who are saying, hey, so, so there's a request, right, from, from an American senator. Right? So the movement, black consciousness movement, is very militant. So no, 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 there's no way that we're going to meet with an American senator. That's the system. Mm. Right? Nico goes to his comrades who are in prison at that time, and he says to them, I'm going to meet with this guy. OK? But write the memo. You must write the memo of what I must say to him. Right? Because as a leader, he knows that this struggle needs to be broadcast internationally. We need 
This guy is in the Senate. We need to put international pressure. So, so it's, it, it's not a question of just being practical. Mm -hmm. It's a question of being strategic, right? But, right? And then, and then what he does is he drives all the way to Cape Town to try and convince some radicals here who don't want this, right? And then he gets arrested and he dies. What I'm saying is all leaders will always have to perform that function, whether they like it or not. I'm chosen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of the Q&A session. However, Prof is going to be outside. We can engage further I'm outside. Really, I'm taking you. <laughs> perhaps, Prof, we can, <laughs> Pro, perhaps, Prof, we can be one of the universities that you launch your book in when it's ready, because there still seems to be a hunger for engagement. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to call on Asipem Kalisa to give us the closing remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark Ajeni, for giving um, this lecture the dignity it deserves. Um, greetings to everyone. Okwam Kukbulel. It is such a pity that we cannot take one more questions and comments, but I hope that we will use the spaces that we have to advance the discussion started here and the path that we are being led on in critically reflecting on Mandela. <coughs> what Graham Hope made to our namesake, Nelson Mandela University, that we have had this lecture this evening. I think I speak on behalf of the room and those joining us via Skype or streamlining to say that it has been a privilege to be found here today and to have been part of many centenary celebrations that have taken place in our university this year. Thank you so much for joining us in honoring Dr. Nelson Mandela's memory, his life, his work, and his continuous role in our lives in one way or another. As the Vice Chancellor has said, that this may, may be an annual event, so we have all come here together to make history by co-inaugurating this first set of Mandela lectures here at Nelson Mandela University. While we look forward to many more Mandela lectures, the challenge has been set forward here today by Prof. Kalila Mang, which should be kept in our discussion tables occupied. One being the challenge to locate Madiba in the nature of the tragic action of our history or any other historical and intellectual act. In doing so, we will then move from, we will then move away from romanticizing Mandela and interrogate the broader tragic history and intellectual scholarship. Masbulele Gue, Tata, Prof Mangu, for the kind of knowledge that you embody and the kind of thinking that you have brought to the table through these lectures. Also extending our gratitude, as I've said, to Mark Ajeni for giving us the opportunity and paving the way for us to listen to Prof. Man. And also to thank in absentia, Umama, Vice Chancellor of Nelson Mandela University, or Prof. Simbongi Lemutwa, the Office of the Dean of Students, all heads of departments um, present today, faculty members and staff, as well as the friends of the university from the Nelson Mandela Museum, not forgetting the visiting scholars and all the delegates from the Youth Convention. I cannot also forget the community members from around the city, students of our university and activists. Thank you all for being here today. Lastly, from an organizational point of view, while the evening went seamlessly, there is a bit of organization that goes into it. So thank you to many people that collaborated to bringing through this Mandela lecture series. The DVC, 
Lebohang Hashate in, in his absentia, CSL, University Events Committee, and the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation, Krisha at my home. <laughs> and lastly, I would like also to tell you that there are refreshments outside. So colleagues, please grab something before you go home. Thank you very much.